Excellent. OK, so I see Saul up here. Uh, so I'm going to just give a quick introduction of everyone here. Um, and then much like the other panels, they're going to give a little five minute uh, introduction background as to where they came from. And then we're going to really dive in. I have a lot of, that we'd like to talk about. Uh, I think there's a lot here. Um, and I do want to make sure we end on time. So um, joining the panel here, we have five panelists. We have uh, Reza Refi from Intel. Um, I'll let them specifically, but just for everyone, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, Chris Crisanthio from uh, the FCC, uh, Andy Clegg from Google, Tony Rainier from Foundry, uh, and Sana Salus from uh, the University of Durham uh, in the UK. And I'll give a special thanks to Reza and Sana because I know they're joining us quite late in the evening. So I appreciate uh, them being part of this panel. Um, Real quick before we jump into the slides for everyone listening. So the goal, you know, what we're going to talk here is model development and standardization. But in the idea of how do we do this in a way that supports the, you know, the, the theme of this whole ISART in the sense of iterating, right? Normally in traditional uh, spectrum sharing scenarios, it's this large effort. You arrive at one model or models, but at one approach as to do the modeling, and it all goes out the door and you see how it does. And maybe you gather uh, data as to um, on your assumptions and on how, how that was performing, but we never really go back and, well, how can we refine the model? How can we iterate and improve on it? And so if we want to get into this iterative process, right, just like you would any engineer or scientist who's working on a problem, how does that support it in the traditional way that model development's done, both in a time scale wise and frankly, dealing with personalities and organizations, because that's also a challenge as we kind of work on this. And we're going to we're going to touch on a bunch of different topics really through the life cycle of model development here. But uh, with that, I'll, I'll jump in and let Reza go first and introduce himself, and then we'll jump into the panel discussion. So go ahead, Reza. And if we can put the slides up for him. Thank you very much, Billy. Um, and uh, I'm very much glad to be to be here uh, among uh, among friends on on talking about this very important topic. If you could go to the next slide, um, um, yes, just just uh, in place of introduction, I work for Intel Corporation, as, as Billy said. Um, I, I lead what we call emerging spectrum strategies and and planning, and that's. Um, Another way of, of saying that we try to uh, stay the, stay ahead of the uh, stay ahead of the generations and try to uh, intercept uh, uh, regulatory and uh, and uh, and product development uh, in a way that uh, the, the timelines match um, by by uh, by trying to, to to predict what's uh, what's going to be needed uh, uh, in both regulatory and and especially spectrum as well as uh, uh, technology development. I've been involved in standards for for, uh, for, for longer than, than I had, had wanted. Um, and uh, also since 2001, I've been uh, involved with uh, international regulations, uh, specifically with ITU. Um, in, in ITU, uh, uh, I've done various things, but in terms of uh, modeling, um, uh, the most recent one was development of M.2101, which is a recommendation on modeling of 4G, 5G systems for sharing and com compatibility studies. And, and that's, um, that's a model that uh, since it, this, this was developed, uh, every sharing study uh, in the ITU uh, uses this, uh, or, or, or uh, they're supposed to. Um, and uh, uh, currently, I, I, I chair the development uh, and uh, a group that's in charge of the development and update of uh, recommend, uh, a recommendation, a P-series recommendation on, on clutter loss. Um, and uh, we, we're trying to, to update and improve that as, as we go. In terms of other activities, um, I'm, I'm active in, in, in NextG Alliance in, in, in North America. I'm the vice chair of the Spectrum Working Group. And again, we're trying to have a forward-looking uh, uh, angle to, to Spectrum for, for next generation and uh, what, uh, what it needs. Uh, in terms of industry, I'm vice president of GSA, an executive board member representing Intel. 
uh, also a member of uh, FCC TAG, CISRIC, and, and CSMAC. Uh, and my, my focus is um, to the work I do at Intel is, is basically on, on identifying optimal resource, spectral resources for, for next generation, um, uh, an application-centric approach. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Reza. So next, uh, I believe we have Chris from the SEC. Pull his slides. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Crisanthu. Um, and thanks, every, uh, thanks uh, first, uh, Billy, UNN, IA, ITS, to, uh, for the invitation to participate um, in this uh, panel. Um, and uh, provide my uh, perspective, uh, personal perspective on the standardization of propagation model. Um, I'm, 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 two, I'm only two years in FCC under the OAT and um, engage into different areas, including propagation. But uh, my engagement with uh, propagation is uh, it started um, back in mid 80s. Uh, at Polytechnic University with uh, Dr. Bertoni, that uh, it was focusing more my uh, um, an analysis on ERPA propagation. Um, let's go to the next um, slide, please. Um, that that, that uh, for, uh, at that time the focus was um, uh, uh, that it was pr primarily on uh, on on. Um, on, on, as I said, the MERPA propagation, and it was a, a shift at that time that uh, we uh, of the focus on propagation modeling. We went from uh, uh, more uh, uh, microwave links that they were in rural area uh, into much more uh, uh, analysis in uh, of propagation modeling in much uh, complex environment. In, air, in in urban in in, air, in cities, so uh, and and that also changed the mechanism of propagation. That uh, in in uh, urban environment you you have a multiple uh, um, uh, diffraction um, uh, mechanism over the rooftops. That was well explained back then by Vogler, Dr. Bertoni, and and others. Um, through the, the in early in the 90s, so we saw a lot of other analytical and simplified models in urban uh, uh, propagation to consider and account for the canyon effects. Um, however, going from this uh, modeling that it was uh, presented in a lot of papers into building a standardized software tool that will represent that kind of environment, it was a big challenge. And it's still a challenge. Um, uh, one of the reasons it was the lack of, of data that will allow us to characterize these uh, environments, and specifically the 2D and 3D vector data that provide information on buildings and streets. Um, the other big problem, it was very limited measurements uh, that they will allow you to use to validate uh, the models. Um, so and another issue, I think, and, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit, and to build a propagation tool, is, it is a, a complex effort, and it requires a lot of different expertise. And, um, uh, and, and that we saw also having uh, sometimes difficulty to find people that we have uh, a good knowledge uh, especially of geospatial engines. Um, that I think, um, this kind of main resource, I think it, it led us in back in 90s to kind of uh, depend uh, still on, uh, on uh, terrain-based uh, models for rural areas and um, empirical and semi-empirical uh, formulas in, for urban environments. Let's go to the next slide. So, but however, I think um, uh, in the last few years, and, uh, and, and even from uh, uh, 
2000s, we see some uh, of these obstacles to start to become overcome. We see more geodata uh, data uh, be available to us. And uh, and also there is much more uh, measurements uh, thanks to the efforts of NTIA, uh, ITS and other agencies. So that help us to, to do some uh, steps uh, forward. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, it's still an issue of getting the geodata. Um, and if you're trying to procure it, it is very expensive. Um, so that, that I think that right now we are in a crossroads. I, I do believe right now a lot of things started to fall in the right place. And the question we have to really answer is that, uh, and, and the answer is that how we can involve our processes, all right? To for standardize the the software tools uh, and, and propagation uh, software propagation tools, um, along with data and measurements, that they can help really to uh, have a better and more efficient spectrum sharing. And I don't speaking about. Um, um, uh, modeling in ITU standards that suddenly they they they, they are very careful or uh, in other uh, standards. But I'm speaking about uh, building a a platform, all right, a, a platform that we can allow us to do plug and play, uh, validate our models, uh, and also kind of give us some acceptance uh, based on analysis of these uh, tools. It, it's going from modeling to software uh, tools. It, it is a different. It's a different board game, all right. It's a, it's not any. It it is now when you're talking about tool, uh, um, we're speaking about a product, and I think we need to treat it like that and put the framework around that in order to be able to uh, uh, develop it and validate these tools. I don't think this is a new idea, but I think we. I think. Right now, maybe we need to again discuss it. And one idea uh, that um, I think it may help um, is to build a, a, to have an independent uh, testing the lab that it can facilitate this access of uh, of plug and play and validate. And you have there the data the that you need, like terrain or or, or building data, in order to do your analysis. Um, it's uh, certainly a, uh, this is a, a, an expensive proposition, and, uh, and certainly when uh, if we have that uh, discussion with uh, the government in the industry, uh, we need to consider uh, how we're going to share the cost. Um, to understand, kind of to give an illustration of the complexities that we, uh, at least in my perspective, uh, run. Uh, for building a propagation model, I, 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 I do have here something that we are doing in-house in FCC right now that is a, a, a capability that we really um, started, uh, started back in U.S. Army CERTEC that was working there and CERTEC uh, provide the rights for the, for the code. And you can see on the left the, a very complex uh, urban environment. And I think that picture is from <laughs> back from uh, 2008 that I have shape files of Baltimore. Only a few cities uh, I had access. And, and, and that you need in, in RGS, we're using an RGIS to go and extract key parameters from that environment to kind of fit the uh, simplified um, models uh, on the right. Um, uh, as you can see, they, um, uh, after you finish this modeling, uh, then it is the question where I'm going to get the geodata. And on top of that, where I'm going to have measurements on the same in the same city. It was very interesting. Uh, a lot of times you have geodata in one city, but a measurements in another, but not in the same place. And that was a big problem 10 years ago. But I think now um, this data becomes more available to have for geodata for different cities and measurements in maybe in a lot of different cities and topologies. Uh, next, please. Uh, here, what I think that is a, a roadmap um, uh, that uh, that we go we went through 
as, as, an, as an industry. Uh, we started somehow with a very empirical models, but as the features they become available to us, like a clutter class, uh, terrain we have for so long time building, then we can really actually build much more complex and accurate models. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think uh, still, uh, even if we consider several features of to characterize an, an environment, we may need some empirical formulation uh, due to the complexity of, of an environment. The environments, uh, especially urban environments are changing. And also there's a lot of um, uh, parameters that they cannot be all them captured in shape files. Uh, so that the empirical formulation maybe it can be uh, determined using um, um, uh, the collected data, crowdsourced data uh, by sensing. And you apply some new techniques from artificial intelligence machine language to, to determine that kind of, uh, uh, of uh, empirical uh, contribution. Uh, next, please. So here I'll leave you with uh, some uh, my last thoughts that um, uh, propagation, modeling, uh, standardization of that, uh, along with data and uh, measurements is just one of the a lot of other capabilities that they will be required to do the um, uh, uh, efficient spectrum sharing. And, um, uh, um, and I don't think uh, working by ourselves uh, uh, in, in silos, it will help us. It's a, a built-in propagation tools and all other capabilities. It requires a lot of resources and, um, and, 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 and it requires some also consensus between industry and uh, government. Um, I do believe uh, creating some environment that uh, will allow us to do, as I said, a plug and play, uh, it will help a lot. And I know that I, NTIA ITS, it tries something like that uh, based on your description, um, Billy. Um, um, I think that's where I, uh, I will leave it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide my uh, perspective. Thanks, Chris. Um, next, we'll go, Andy, if you want to give just a, a quick overview. Um, yep. Uh, the thing, and we can dive into the discussion. Go sure. Ahead. Yep. Uh, really quick. So uh, I'm Andy Clegg, Spectrum Engineering Lead at uh, Google. Been involved in the development of the standards and 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 involved in the proceeding for CBRS uh, since before CBRS existed. Now working on AFC systems, so a lot of experience with uh, spectrum sharing frameworks and also the use of propagation models in them. Uh, I made a lot of noise during the uh, creation of uh, uh, CBRS standards with regard to the fact that we were using overly conservative propagation models, and I'll explain why I think that. Uh, in, in four pictures. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is the first picture. So when we embarked upon CBRS, one of the first things I did was created a measurement campaign for propagation loss in the 3.5 gigahertz band. And so I did the area outside of Washington, D.C., where I live, um, and set up a system to, to measure propagation loss in the 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, and what we what we found is sort of represented on this plot. The, the blue dots are the actual propagation loss that we measured. Um, the green dots are the prediction from the ITM model, and the red dots are the you know difference between the two on a point by point um, basis. And if you note, the distance that we're looking at here is only a kilometer. And if you look at this we have uh, cases where the ITM predicted loss is, you know, over, well over 50 dB less than what the actual loss is. And so if we use a model like this to, for spectrum sharing, we're going to be using a lot, we're going to be leaving a lot of spectrum on the table because ITM is going to tell us the loss is something, but in fact, the real loss is a lot more, and we could have packed more people into the spectrum. So this was a very uh, big eye-opener for me in, in the first introduction to how unsuited ITM is to actually doing propagation loss measurements for spectrum sharing. So next slide is, uh, why is this? Well, it's, it's actually, uh, when you look at it, it's very easy to understand why ITM underpredicts uh, loss um, 
uh, or uh, in in urban environments and suburban environments. So this is a picture from Google Earth, 3D represent, representation from Google Earth of uh, Manhattan. And Manhattan is a very challenging propagation environment because you have all of these big buildings sticking up and everything. And so to Chris's uh, presentation last, all of these buildings actually add a lot of attenuation to the signal traveling from one part of Manhattan to the other. But if you go to the next slide, this is what ITM thinks Manhattan looks like. It doesn't know anything about the third dimension of the, of the clutter of the buildings. It thinks everything is flat, and the only thing it takes into account is terrain. But obviously, the propagation environment in a place like Manhattan is a lot more complicated than just the terrain. The buildings add many, many dB of additional loss that is not considered an ITM. Yet, we are using the ITM model for interference protection in CDRS. So it's entirely unsuitable for that, in my opinion. I was really happy to hear about all the work that uh, Billy described that they're working on. Um, so I'll leave you with the last example of why uh, ITM is unsuitable. If you go to the next slide. Um, so for those of you familiar with, DP, uh, with uh, CBRS, the red areas are the dynamic protection areas where chips operate radar um, out in the ocean, out to a couple hundred kilometers or so. And the green areas are what have been defined by NTIA in the industry as the dynamic protection area neighborhoods. These are the areas in which um, CBRS devices that are limited to 50 watts EIRP must be considered for their potential interference to ships that are as much as 200 kilometers offshore. And it's really amazing when you look at this plot that, you know, are we really saying that a, uh, a 50 watt device in a valley in West Virginia could really cause interference to a ship 200 kilometers off the coast of North Carolina? And the answer that ITM tells you is yes, that's possible because it, you know, the, the prediction shows that it could have a significant contribution or a not insignificant contribution to interference 200 kilometers off the coast. Of course, to most engineers, that seems like a nonsensical conclusion, but that's what comes out of ITM. The reason it comes out of ITM is the troposcatter mode. It's a persistent mode of propagation off of, uh, you know, weather and index of refraction variabilities in the troposphere. And the troposcatter predictions in ITM are what cause the prediction of potential interference over very large distances because it propagates up into the troposphere and back down, up into the high parts of the troposphere and back down again. But the fact is the troposcatter model in ITM has never really been fully validated and certainly not in a range of environments at a range of frequencies in a range of time never been validated. It's basically based upon a few points of data that were acquired closer to the time of Marconi than the present day, and yet we're building modern spectrum management and spectrum sharing frameworks built upon the troposcatter model. Uh, it's really cool to hear uh, Billy say that they're actually building troposcatter links and testing it. The reason why this is difficult to test and validate is the troposcatter mode predicts, you know, typically well into the 200s of db of propagation loss 230 240 250 db loss even um and that's a really large amount of loss that's very difficult to measure um and so you need specialized equipment high gain antennas all sorts of other things high power transmitters to test it and it's not an easy test to do so so kudos to its to, to getting involved in in testing and validating the tropo scatter model um, in, in ITM. So we'll be very, uh, very interested to see the results. We hope that what they determine is that the troposcatter loss is actually much higher than ITM predicts. If you find that it's much lower, I want to talk to you before you publish those results. Uh, but otherwise, um, we're, we're very excited to see that uh, they're embarking upon that. So anyway, that's it. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Andy. Uh, <laughs> very good. Uh, uh, we'll jump over to Tony Rainier. Uh, Boundary. Um, go ahead, Tony, if we can bring up his slides. All right. Hey, guys, everybody. I'll, uh, I'll try to go quickly. Um, I sometimes tend to talk longer, but um, we'll try to make up some time here. So first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. I uh, really appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about particularly all the work we've done in SSTD. I've been hearing through the whole conference um, issues um, that I believe, in, at least in some small way, we've been trying to or have addressed in SSTD. So I'm anxious to talk about that. Um, before I get in, just as, as a disclaimer, 
Um, I'm, I'm going to try not to say anything too terribly controversial, but if I do, it's just me. It's not, I don't represent DSO, SSDD, or, or any other organization that I'm affiliated with. So next slide, please. Hey, in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep this short. Um, I've been working in Spectrum. I'm a newbie, really. If you, and most of the people I work with, they say, oh, you've only been here since 2007. You, you know, you don't know anything. But um, I've been here since 2007. I work with a lot of the DOD tools. Um, a lot of it includes um, propagation analysis. Um, but the most important piece here, um, at least for this discussion today and for the panel, um, is the work that I took on in 2005. Um, and in that work, I, the chief engineer of the of the SSCD program, we've heard a lot about SSTD from various folks of the panel. So I'm grateful to hear that. Um, but just as a note, we're going to talk now today and have a discussion about propagation. But um, SSTD is a lot more than propagation. Um, and this model standardization techniques, capabilities that I'm going to talk about today, we've been applying them to the LTE 4G5G characterization, DOD receiver characterization. Um, as well as aggregate interference assessments. So we have four different buckets of models uh, that we work on to try to do standardization again. So next slide. Oops. Okay. Um, before we get into some of the key perspectives gleaned from the propagation modeling, just a couple of notes on SSTD. Again, we've already talked a lot about it in the conference, but uh, if you if you haven't had a chance or you haven't been tracking it, that uh, I've got sort of a timeline there on the left. It's a very high level, and and really the big takeaway there is you know the, one of the themes of the conference is we have a linear regulatory process, um, and how what are the ways in which we can turn that into an iterative process, uh, and at least in our way, and at least with AWS three though it does absolutely adhere to the linear model. Um, we've taken sort of the, you know, the initial look, the first thing that came out when the analysis started. Uh, we've been iterating um, for, for really for six years, working to improve the models and improve um, the, the predictions that are made uh, in terms of the, the coexistence and spectrum sharing. Um, and so it's not the, the full deal. It's not obviously the idea that we could go back to the FCC and have an updated RNO or something like that. Based on the findings that we've had in the last six years, that's not in place, obviously. Uh, but at least in terms of the way that matters to AWS3 licensees, we have been iterating and, and we've, I think we've had some good success there. And in terms of the right side, just a couple of notes. Um, SSTD is, because we've been around for six years, we've had an opportunity to do a lot of really great work. Uh, but just a few things to highlight here um, for people that are really interested in propagation, and I think most people um, here are. Um, we've gotten and we had an opportunity to do a lot of data collection. Um, we've worked with ITS for almost the entire six years. Chris Hammersman, who's now retired, and her team were tireless in their efforts to go out and measure. But 14 different areas across the U.S. were uh, and really high quality, good measurements were made. So we've got a lot of drive taste data that we've been able to collect. Um, the second big item in terms of data is something that's new for us and one that we haven't yet had a chance to explore. Uh, but we've been part we partnered with the FAA. And, then, and the FAA has this program called the ADSB program, where all all aircraft that fly in the U.S. are required to transmit every few seconds um, flight data about where they are, where they're going, things like that. Um, and there are 700 ground stations spread across the U.S. that receive these signals. In some cases, a given transmission might be received by 40 different ground stations. Each of those ground stations records the received power, the signal levels um, of those messages, and you combine that signal level with where the aircraft is when they made the transmission, and you're talking about a ton of, of propagation data uh, that can be gleaned from that. So um, we're really excited about that database and the opportunity to, to explore it. A second key item um, for coming out of SATD program is um, the development of two, um, what I call differential propagation measurement techniques. Both of these techniques use ubiquitous transmitters. In one case, we're using GPS satellites, and the other, again, we're using these ADSB transmissions. Um, and we have um, an embedded receiver somewhere in clutter or in a building, for instance. And then we have a clear line of sight um, receiver. And by comparing those two measurements, you know, we get a good estimates of what the clutter or building loss, building exit loss data is for that. Um, this ability to get a 360 degree azimuth, you zero the 90 elevation angle view um, of, of the building penetration or clutter is something that's extremely useful uh, in our AWS3 assessment. So we're really excited about that. Um, third, and one again that's somewhat new for us, we just started about a year ago, we finally got enough data uh, 
in-house where we started thinking about using machine learning techniques. And I know it's, it's sort of a hot item and a bit of a buzzword these days, um, but I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that we've actually been able to use some of these techniques to generate a, a much improved category model, which I'll talk more about probably during the discussion, um, and even a predictive model for clutter, which was something I, I just, I never believed that we'd be able to get to. Uh, but we did, we have that. And in fact, we're presenting to the FCC tech um, later this summer, if you're interested in that work. Also, um, I'll just note that there's um, several papers uh, that we were provided as part of the ISART conference. Um, if you go to the, what's it, the, uh, I forget what the, the link is, but um, if you go to the type page and you can go and you can get all that. So there's a lot of papers to talk about all the SSTD work um, that are available. Oh, it's the bibliography and resources tab. I see that now. So, all right, um, next slide. So in the planning meeting for this panel, I was sort of asked to provide perspectives on standardization propagation model. Um, to answer that question, I think back to some of the key things that are the most important things that we discussed over the last six years as we worked our way through um, the beginning, the initial state, uh, what we got generally out of CSMAC and was sort of the starting condition, um, and then where we are today. <laughs> and the first one, I'm sorry that I'm like the eighth person in the conference to bring this up, but you know, you can't overstate it. Um, you know, George Fox, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, it can be sometimes hard to resist the urge to dive into the weeds of an enticingly complex problem. But I'm going to give credit to Howard McDonald, um, who until very recently uh, was a DSO lead for this work, um, helping us to remember that fussing over a 0.1 dB mouse only stole time from the resources when there were 10 dB tigers in the room. So this is really important to keep in mind when you're working on, on, on modeling. Um, the second idea here is propagation is a highly variable phenomenon. I guess you know, that probably would not come as a surprise to anyone who's studied it for more than five minutes. Uh, but when you get into the modeling part, it's it's sometimes easy and even convenient to ignore the randomness inherent in, in the phenomenon. And when you consider that two, two identical propagation measurements day to day are often plus or minus 7 dB, it really starts to change the way you think about your models and how you want to try to model something. Um, I'll credit Paul McKenna from ITS. He, he worked with us tirelessly um, throughout the program for ensuring that we didn't forget this fundamental truth and that if, if we do have to decide that we can't use the random variable, the proper dist distribution to represent something, um, that we'd be very careful about how we choose the equivalent value. Um, just as an example, a 5 dB clutter loss is not equivalent to a 0 to 10 dB uniform clutter loss distribution. If you care about aggregate appearance, that is. So thank you, Paul, for that. Um, the last item here on this one is, um, is it not one model to rule them all? This is not one that I've heard in the conference, although I think there have been folks that have alluded to it. Um, going, going back to the idea that all models are wrong, if you try to use the same model everywhere, you're going to be even more wrong. A simple example of this comes in the form of, of whether reflections have an effect on signal levels from an interferer. The answer is, of course, yes and no. And using the right model that addresses the most important aspects of the environment is key. Also, it's important to understand that almost always a propagation model is created to answer some other question. For example, will my radio work when I see, or will I see interference from a radar? Depending on the question that that model was supposed to answer or be part of the answer to, you might find differences in the way people went at it and some of the assumptions that they might. I credit Chris Anderson of the U.S. Naval Academy for reminding us to check the label on all of our models and resist the urge to try to find that one-size-fits-all approach. It doesn't. All right, next slide. Now to talk about the perspectives on standardization, which is really what we're here to talk about today. You can't measure the world, but a, a model that's untethered from measurements is hard to trust, and so, much, and so what's a modeler to do? It is important to do your best to bridge the gap. On SSCD, we, we used the data we had to validate propagation techniques that predicted the propagation loss for a given path. Then we took those techniques out for a walk around the country, giving them the geospatial data they needed, and then using software to generate distributions for an, an LTE sector, which, is, which was the decision point for the business process for AWS3. Finally, we used those category models. We used category models to combine like sectors to generate distribution. The next point is that there is safety in numbers. If you're assessing an aggregate interference from a large field of emitters, getting propagation loss right for each one isn't as important as getting it right on average. It's okay if I'm a little low in one as long as I'm a little high on the next, that idea. 
The approach works well for site general models where you have categories. It, however, can be quite tricky if you're trying to increase fidelity on your way to site-specific models. So it's uh, you, you do it at the beginning, but remember, as you try to get better, that some of that, that safety goes away because your numbers get smaller. By far, the most important perspective is the one that I have, we've been talking about all week. It's the last one here. Trying to do model standardization is a big bang event where the research team toils away for a week or even months to generate a propagation model that is then presented as a fait accompli is problematic to say the least. An iterative approach that tackles one issue at a time, includes stakeholder collaboration, solidifies agreements as you go, and allows for the technical work to incorporate lessons learned in one iteration into the results for the next is a much better approach. Howard McDonald refers to this as peeling the onion, and it yielded very good results for SSTD. Thanks. Thanks. You, <laughs> and last, uh, uh, Dr. Sluis, son, if you want to go ahead and give a quick uh, overview. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. I've got some slides. Okay, so um, I'm coming from the academic point of view, and I'll give some overview about the work that we have been involved with, in particular, of course, in the ITU. So the topic that I've chosen for this evening is the 5G models, because these were quite challenging in the sense that um, there were, you would see that the frequency bands that were identified were fairly diverse and also the environments are fairly diverse. So if we go to the next slide. So my background is that I have been working in radio propagation for about 40 years. And I first started in long range propagation studies in the HF band, and I then moved up gradually now to the millimeter wave. And in order to do these various propagation measurements and modeling, um, I tend to design my own radio measurement capability. So we have custom designed radio channel sounders. I also work a little bit on radar, but this is not the topic for this evening. And the results that we have done recently were contributed to the RTU study group three. And the RTU have several study groups and the one that um, working with is the one that works on propagation. And study group three, and you mentioned McKenna, Paul McKenna, because he is also involved in the same group. It works in both the ionized and non-ionized media. So basically, from my point of view, it covers all the areas that I have been involved in, in terms of propagation from ionospheric up to now the millimeter wave. So next slide, please. So the challenges for the 5G models is that we were, there was the World Radio Communications Conference in 2015, and then they presented us with a fairly long list of potential frequency bands. And you can see this, these were ranging from 24 gigahertz up to 86 gigahertz. And that's a very big challenge if you are trying to build uh, custom designed equipment in order to do these measurements. They were also different bandwidths, so they were covering from 1.6 gigahertz to, you can see, 6.5 or even 10 gigahertz. And the ones that are highlighted in red in this table are the ones that we have um, built some equipment in Durham in order to do measurements that we contributed to the models that were developed for 5G. To go to the next slide, please. So the other challenge is not just that we had to have a very wide range of frequencies. We also had to cover numerous different scenarios. And I've put here the RTU recommendations that we have contributed to. So for the outdoor environments, it is RTUR P 1411. And for the indoor environments, it is RTUR P 1238. And they deal with different types of scenarios. So when you look on 1411, 
it tells you that it has classifications and we've heard from the previous presenters talking about urban, dense urban, suburban, residential and so on. So you would have to look at all of these different environments, try to do measurements across different parts of the world because the idea that these models are site general, so they should be applicable not just in Durham, but they should also be applicable in Japan, in the US and different parts of the world. Again, for the indoor environments, also we had to look at different potential environments and different classifications. And currently there is a great deal of interest in industrial environment. So we needed to find some typical factory type of environment in order to do measurements. And these are quite challenging and completely different from a shopping mall or a conference room type of environment. If you go to the next slide, please. Another issue that came up, uh, a question that came to the ITU is, uh, if you are now going up in frequency, would you be able to use the same frequency band indoor and also outdoor? And so there was a necessity to identify the propagation or the penetration loss between outdoor to indoor. And in order to do this, there was a new recommendation that was developed uh, for 5G and that was 2109. And in order to do this, we had to go to a specific site in the UK, which is the building research establishment, because again, in order to come up with a model that is applicable universally, you also had to have typical types of buildings. So in the UK, they have what they classify as traditional and modern buildings. And the traditional buildings, like a Victorian house or an 80s build, and the modern buildings would have higher type of glass and double glass and so on. So they would have higher penetration loss. So again, we had to go to that specific site and do these measurements, which were collaborative with Ofcom, the UK regulator. Go to the next slide, please. And finally, what we have also looked at is fixed links. So, for example, you wanted to look at backhaul, and generally, um, all of these various fixed links previously were done over fairly long range. So, the fact that 28 gigahertz was studied for many years, the impact of precipitation on 28 gigahertz have been studied for a long time, for example, in Rutherford and Appleton labs. They have looked at it for long distances. But then if you wanted to now, now look at it in the built environment, you do need to have shorter links. And that now we looked at an ITU, an existing ITU recommendation, which is ITU RP530. And it had some models that were applicable for distances greater than 500 meters and above. And the link that we have set up was typical for a building to building type of uh, environment, potentially across a few meters. So we set up these links about 36 meters. And there is also a general perception that a millimeter wave is primarily line of sight. And therefore, if you put, you can actually have more than one link between buildings. You direct one to the other building and you should be okay if there is another link. So we put one at an angle, 45 degrees, totally non-line of sight. And we found out that we could actually get a signal from the non-line of sight. So there is interference in that situation, even though people have traditionally thought that it shouldn't be an issue. And we've studied the impact of precipitation using um, and the picture you would see on the left hand side, to my side anyway, uh, is a disdrometer which measures the rain uh, parameters, the drop size distribution, the rainfall rate and so on. And we studied it on two frequencies, on the 28 gigahertz and also the 70 gigahertz. Of course, now that we are moving to 6G bands, we are going to update all of our equipment to the next two frequencies, which extend up to 300 gigahertz. So that's the next phase. But so far, these are the different recommendations that 
our research at Durham University contributed to in terms of the propagation models. So I will leave it at that point and thank you for the Thank you, Sana. And so with that, I want to start to jump in here with the discussion. Like I said, we're going to kind of cover the arc of model development um, and how that can be, and standardization, how that can be applied to this iterative approach. And I think the, the best place to start is really not a, um, shall you say, a technical question, but it's, it's, it's one of these soft ones, but I really think it sets the foundation for everything we want to go to. And it's, right, when we do have these sorts of conversations, when we bring to the table, whether it's um, the SAS work that Andy talked about or the AWS3 that uh, Tony talked about, and, you, and I know you've all had different experiences dealing with various um, organizations, you know, what ends up happening is we bring people together, we bring engineers together, ideally. Um, sometimes that's not always true. They come with their own organizational biases. Um, and that's not a negative necessarily to everyone, right? If you're a government agency with an, uh, some incumbent system that's a safety of life and that's your mission, you know, it's in your interest to maximize the protection of that asset versus if you're a commercial entity, you have a financial stake as to what's coming on and you, you do, it does color your opinion as to what types of approaches you come to with. And, you know, and I don't want to get into, um, we're going to protect the, the guilty and the innocent and not name names. Although if you have positives, you know, call out, you feel free to offer this up. But we have, we, we start off on this foundation and we bring people from varied backgrounds and we have to start establishing trust. If we want to be able to have these conversations in a collaborative and productive manner, if we want to read this, we want to revisit. Um, so talking with Andy showed there in his slides, uh, the idea that maybe we can iterate this and make these models better, ignoring the um, the impacts to like auctions and stuff that I have there. We need to have this foundation of trust that we can really have an open conversation before we even get to the technical aspects of that and critiquing each other's work. You know, we need to establish that foundation. And so uh, I'll, point, I'll throw this question to you first, Reza, because I know you've dealt with this some in, in the clutter group within the ITU. And then Tony, I'll go to you because you've had some positive um, experiences you alluded to with the AWS3 work. Um, how do we manage and establish that framework right from the start where we can we can uh, uh, develop that trust so that when we have those hard and technical questions, it's not taken personally and we can revisit those decisions later on. Yeah, thank, thank you, Billy. Uh, and uh, and I, I apologize, I was in the impression that we're doing intros first and then, so I didn't present actually my content slide, which actually goes very directly into what, what you're asking. So if, if I could ask uh, that, uh, that slide that I didn't present but to be put put back on the screen. I think I think uh, especially with the uh, with the clutter group that uh, that you mentioned that is uh, uh, that's quite important. Is it possible that, that we get that? Last? Yes. This. Thank you. Um, so especially in the in the context of of, of clutter and um, and and the the, the pictures that, that Andy showed showed actually quite um, uh, directly. Uh, Presented the, the importance of, of uh, taking clutter into account. So we had various types of inputs in terms of measurements, uh, the simulations, uh, both ray tracing and monocolor simulations, and, uh, and and we looked at a variety of those. Um, there there were some some issues with with harmonizing methods, right? We uh, harmonizing methods, and then we say in standardization. Not necessarily in the, in the sense of you know an SDO publishing a standard, but but mostly harmonizing guidelines that people use. We've seen that um, actually harmonizing the uh, the verification process, the collation of, of data to increase variability, to enhance the model. These these are these are very very important. Um, we have seen. Um, for instance, the, the measurements that you get in, in different urban, urban, as, as an example, urban areas in different parts of the world look, look very different. Um, in order to be able to, um, to have a larger pool of data uh, to draw empirical models out of, uh, you would want to make sure that the, 
the kind of environment that that you take measurements in are are comparable or or or, or uh, uh, complementary, right? So and, and so it's important to to. Um, to record exactly what kind of environment. Some some people are, are very detailed in what the, what they present, like Professor Salus. But but some others are not. They're, they they opt for for brevity, right? So and, and that makes it uh, makes it a little difficult to just you know right away go go into the uh, uh, the, the, the processing of the data. Uh, one one of the things uh, that would be very important. And to to and we have seen this in the clutter um, development uh, is is what I call calibration calibration of data and and also a, a, a calibration of, of of the equipment and, and the measurement methods. Um, we have seen that simulation, for instance, simulation assumptions have been very important in in all the ray tracing that we have seen uh, presented to to us. Uh, uh, whether you put the antenna right next to the building or whether you put it, you, you randomly drop it somewhere in, in the middle of the street, sometimes makes a, makes a big difference in the outcome. Uh, you, you might not think that, you know, harmonizing the antenna placement is, is such an important, important element, but, but it is. Um, in, in, in ITU, in study group three, we have, we have tried to create these, these forms for people to fill out. But they're not really descriptive enough. There, there are still a lot of things that that people can uh, uh, can introduce. You have tried to make these forms not just for, for measurements, but also for ray tracing. But we've noticed that, for instance, different versions of, of digital maps uh, have have differences in, in a way that that create very different results in terms of one building being there or not being there, depending on the time of uh, the, 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 uh, the production of the map. One thing that, um, in, in my view, is going to help us quite a bit or through uh, creating this, what I call, interim results. Um, for instance, just an example, let's say two people are doing um, measurements in the same frequency range in, in two different urban areas, one, let's say, in, in Australia, another one in um, in, in, in Denver, right? What's urban in, two, in these two, two different places might, might look different. So having an idea of how these two urban areas compare through creating some of these um, um, interim results, for instance, st statistics of multipath, um, accompanying the measurement data with the power delay profile, to also let us have an idea of how these two uh, environments compare to each other. Or if you're doing simulations, um, uh, providing also the probability of line of sight, distance to, distance to first building or second building, these kind of things to, to, to accompany the, the, the measurement or, or the simulation data to, to, to give us a, um, to give us more means of, 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 of being able to compare, right? And, and, and verify the, the proposals. So these are some of the things that, um, that, that remind me at, at, at least would go a long way in, uh, in trying to enhance, enhance the models that we have and also arrive at, 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 at new models and extending uh, various aspects of, of the Existing models, the frequency, the environment, etc. Thank, thank thanks, Rose. And I should say, the panel, as we as we go, if you guys want to jump in um, and respond or disagree with anything people say, uh, feel free to. Um, as we go from there, um, I know Tony, you've had, uh, as as has been alluded to, some success in this area of kind of really having developing a good relationship between, um, you know, and the AWS three. The DOD side and the commercial side, where you've kind of, as you allude to in your talk, uh, and other people in this panel, working through and and you know breaking down the problem into smaller and smaller chunks and taking them off the table, um, and that's really you don't always have that sort of relationship between the the entities that you can do that. I don't know. Would you like to make some comments on that? I think it's worthwhile. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, Billy. Um, 
we're, we were lucky, you know, in that um, we had a little bit of time. Again, if you think about how CSMAC, you know, works, you know, they get two weeks, they got to come up with a model. It's, it's just sort of a, you know, a big free for all in some cases. But we were able to, and initially, you know, just it just took time. In the beginning, there was very little trust. It was, you know, very little, gee, what yours is mine and mine is yours, now, none of that. Um, but because we were sort of were focusing on a fact based or a physics based problem, um, and we were able to all get together and, and collaborate with each other. What I what we found almost every single time is if you actually you know sit down with someone across the table from someone else who also is sort of signed up to this fact based physics based analysis, and you walk them through why you think what you think, and then they walk you through why they think what they think, you can almost always figure out where the disconnect is and figure out you know how to come together. I we never had a single experience where we actually finally if it, when we had a problem. We sat down with the other, whether it was, you know, folks in the commercial wireless industry or folks, you know, on the military side, we sat down and talked with them. Um, we were always able to get there. And I think that's a testimony to the, to the you know, the good faith part of it. You know, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts kind of thing. We didn't really experience any of that. We had a lot of obstacles initially, but by patience and going through a very detailed way and inviting everybody into the actual process of generating the models, we were able to overcome all that. So it was, you're right, it was a very positive experience on our, on our end. Yeah, I think that's great. And, I, and I'm gonna transition on there, you know, um, throw over to Andy. When we start talking about model development, you know, I, uh, Paul Tillman at Microsoft made a comment yesterday in the data panel that the 3.5 SAS, you know, if we did it today, it would be different. Um, there were things we learned. And of course that lends to one of the topics here we're kind of talking overarching is how can we incorporate and then maybe iterate faster? Um, I know it's clear from your presentation, uh, you know, you've had some views and you've talked about this before kind of in the modeling development, but um, you know, as, as Tony said there, sometimes we, uh, it's not necessarily our choice, but we don't have enough time to get that initial, um, right? We hit Congress kind of says something or it comes down from regulators and we have to hit the ground running and you start somewhere and we may know it's conservative, but that's usually where you want to start. Um, uh, and as you showed there, you know, there's, there's room for improvement. Um, you know, how, how, let me give your take on kind of some of that modeling and, and incorporating that in as to how you can kind of work that problem iteratively uh, and objectively, right? Um, with the opinions. So, you know, a, a couple of thoughts on the CBRS regime, and, and it's, it's related to propagation, and it's also related to the lessons learned. Um, one of the lessons learned in CBRS is that um, by nature of how we did the standards and then the certification testing, everything's baked in now. We were tested against a particular propagation model, and that propagation model is now baked into a SAS and effectively unable to change because if we change it, if we change the model we're using, we sort of void our certification. So we sort of baked into the process, the inability to evolve with better knowledge of better propagation models. And I think that was a, a pretty big, um, I, I don't wanna say mistake, but pretty big, uh, something we gave up that we, we probably shouldn't have given up. Um, we should have allowed us to evolve as knowledge progressed. So one statistic I like to throw out is that we've been operating CBRS now for two plus years, and there has not been one reported case of interference to a protected incumbent in the band. Not one reported case of interference to a protected incumbent. In two plus years and over 200,000 base stations deployed, not any reported interference. That tells me one thing. That tells me that we are vastly overprotecting the incumbents because we, you know, that's a basically a 100% reliability. And that means something's wrong in your formulas. And, and a lot of that I attribute to propagation models that are overly conservative. I think there needs to be built into spectrum sharing frameworks, some closed loop mode where we actually determine what the received interference is and feed that back into our systems to be able to account for that. Are we, if we're never interfering, obviously we could turn our power up a little bit or you know, reduce the, the uh, or increase the loss predicted by the models. Um, if interference is predicted, maybe we need to dial it back down a little bit. Um, but none of that's baked into CBRS. 
uh, we're sort of working on baking that a little bit into the AFC uh, thing, but those standards aren't done. So it's not clear we're going to be able to do that, but we definitely need some kind of closed loop way of confirming that the propagation models we're using in spectrum sharing are not overly conservative or not under conservative. But I also recognize, as several of the speakers have said, propagation models are very dynamic. I mean, propagation is dynamic. It varies, you know, sitting in one place, you can see 23 dB of difference in propagation over the course of an hour or so. Um, it, it, you know, so it, it is very dynamic and it's hard to get a handle on, but I think the way we're doing it in CBRS is, is, is not the way we want to do it going forward. And uh, we need a much more dynamic kind of closed loop way of, of validating our propagation models. Yeah, um, I think something you touched there is, you know, to be able to have that feedback loop um, really requires the trust to share the data, right? Whether you're um, including the fact that the data may at first glance, shall we say, not not appear to benefit your own situation, whether on, on what's going on. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's true, right? Because that could just be a first impression of it. And you kind of have to take a um, a whole holistic part of the uh, view of the whole scenario and what's trying to be done. Um, Reza talked about this when he was talking about when you're kind of incorporating data sets, um, you have the problem of both, you have different people taking measurements with different systems, um, incomplete data. You know, uh, Sana, you've taken a lot of measurements. Uh, I'd be curious in your comments on this, you know, because we it's both measurements of people objectively deploying systems, whether they're spectrum monitoring systems or at, but also, uh, data we're talking about is to from the SASs, like you know, 3.5, from the SASs themselves and the operators, what are they seeing and what are they doing? Um, you know, the more the more incomplete the environment we're looking at, the harder it is to really um, improve things. Uh, and so, Sana, do you, uh, here, uh, let me throw over to you on that topic of kind of taking measurement data that you can aggregate together. Um, because yeah, if it's vastly different, that becomes real problematic. With, yeah, sorry, that's what we've done in, in the models that we have developed. So the model that we developed for 1411, the outdoor scenario model, uh, there were mainly three administrations. It was the UK, Japan, and um, ETRI from Korea. And we also had some input from Intel. So these were conducted in different environments, and we did try to measure as much as possible different variations in the classification as given in the recommendations for suburban, urban, dense urban, and so on. And in the end, the model is representative of those data sets. Uh, the measurements needed to be done to a, a certain standard. So I remember that when we first brought in our data because of the high losses in the millimeter wave band we didn't take uh, lots of measurement points and basically ntt said well we've got this high gain amplifier and we're going to take continuous measurements so we had to come back and rebuild our equipment in order to be able to take more data points so what what i'm saying is that there is a need for some agreement for those who are developing the models in terms of the methodology for collecting the data. And we are now uh, approaching, uh, we are now going to hold a meeting uh, next month on um, specifically for that purpose, because we are looking at now even higher frequencies at 140 gigahertz and 235 gigahertz. And it's even more challenging to collect data. So we are going to have a meeting to agree on the number of data points, the spatial separation, the environments, and so on. So a great deal of effort goes into these models, and a great deal of data are collected. But of course, the equipment that uh, are used for these collections need to be verified. And so we sometimes are provided with measurement data that we do not take into the development of the model either because the the setup was not done in the right way as we have all agreed or that the equipment is not appropriate. So it, it's a big challenge. And I appreciate that when you say it might not work in all environments, but I thought that that was something that people have considered in terms of cognitive radio.
So you, you try and monitor the spectrum and then say, well, nobody's using it, maybe I can nip in and use it. But then you are in count, you know, you're facing the hidden node problem where you, there might be actually a primary user, but you've not seen it because you are hidden behind the building or something. So it, it's a big challenge. And I think agreement, uh, we try to do as much as we can in terms of developing these models. And we try to take as much data as possible in different environments to make it as site general as possible. But yes, I mean, for example, the model we developed for 1411, we published it in version 10. Then people went away and did Monte Carlo simulations and came back with a question, why does it do this at these points? So we had to do a little bit more work and refine it in order to answer that question. So the model in 1411.10 is different from 1411.11, the next version, because then we did a little bit of refinement on it when people have used the model and came well, up with I, the question. And I think something there that's important is you have to be, and again, this builds on the idea of trust, is you have to be willing to, right, when you get together and someone takes measurements, that's great. But you have to be willing to be critical of those, and if uh, if if it's decided that they aren't representative or they're something wrong, throw them out. Right? That just because someone took out this point and took measurements doesn't mean they're all the same. Um, and you have to be willing to essentially reject data sets if need be if you're doing some sort of empirical failure. You're taking statistics, um, and that can be. Uh, Right, that could be difficult when people spend a lot of time. Measurements are, are difficult. Um, uh, Chris, you mentioned too, when we talk about the data, the, the environmental data, you know, we've had this wealth of that and that's really valuable. It does, however, sometimes lead to, when we start talking about modeling, um, because there's some, on, a bunch of people's approach on this is, you know, how, how do we set bounds on models, right? You know, Andy alluded to this a little bit as well. But we can uh, we have these models, and perhaps they were they're for specific types of scenarios or specific types of data. And we say we have all this other data now. We want to kind of apply them to it, um, and that can lead to some very um, different sorts of uh, results. As well, we say uh, coming out that might be unexplanatory. So you want to comment on that because I know you guys um, you've been looking at you know using those data sets. Uh, you're on mute, Chris. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, Billy, when you say data sets, you mean measurement data sets? A measurement and environmental, right? Because you've been working a bunch kind of with uh, vector data, um, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily, you know, uh, applicable to all propagation models out there. They, they may not be able to handle that sort of kind of information in their assumptions. Yes, uh, and, 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 and you're, you're right. I mean, if we speaking about environmental um, data sets, we uh, actually, that translate that you have available uh, a, a lot of features. Um, it can be built in, street widths, uh, everything in there. And uh, and the accuracy of the models, in my opinion, uh, it depends how you address these uh, environmental data sets. And, um, uh, and, and, and in my opinion, that is a trusted data. Um, when you build your model, you you need to consider that everything is very relative. All right, it's not uh, it's everything relative between the antenna uh, to the um, uh, uh, rooftop uh, line. Um, uh, you may be in, uh, you have to consider is you are in top of the uh, um, uh, rooftop buildings and uh, um, and other things. But in in my, in the end. In my opinion, is that more features are available, then you are, allow you to address better uh, the, uh, and have better predictions. Um, the uh, the other thing about um, um, measurements, uh, certainly the, the the measurements it's uh, it need to be continuous, and uh, and 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 that's why. In my opinion, down to the road, we may need to have much more ground sourcing data. If I if I respond to your question correctly, for me, ground source data it it, it is more accumulated in in daily basis, and 
and, and maybe if we have sufficient ground source data uh, in, 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 in one city, we may start to look beyond traditional uh, propagation modeling. We can start to look to techniques like creaking that they may allow us to um, uh, validate our measurement data and all data is collected and also allow us to even uh, validate our propagation models. Um, uh, so, so it's, um, uh, I, I think, um, uh, I, I, th I think the, the way that we, we can trust them in the end, all this stuff is allow the people to share this kind of data and allow different people to, uh, as I said, to um, uh, have access and do it iterative uh, using that data and to improve their models. Um, I think, uh, hopefully I yes, answered your question, Billy. So yeah, and, and I think that's an important point is that, you know, um, when we, as a community work on modeling and modeling improvements, I think it's important to to really be transparent about what we're doing so that, right, you know, if there's, uh, you're working on a standard and you're trying to improve things by publishing both the, the work on the model, which usually does get published, but the, the data that goes back up and the assumptions that would allow, right, like Sana has comes from a university background here, allow someone who's objective and as a third party in this to basically perform analysis and look to try to validate some of that, you know, who's been separate from the process. If we, if we think things are closed up and then at the end of the thing, we, as Annie talked about, bake it in and kind of have it at the end, you don't really have that sort of outside feedback. There's no mechanism to bring that in and, and work on the problem. And um, I'll throw this kind of, I know we have like five minutes left as one of our last things is, you know, how, how do we facilitate that iteration? You know, Andy brought up a point, not baking it into the, in the results. And that was clearly different than how it was done within the AWS three, where you had flexibility, Tony, to, to do some of that iteration and work on the problem that way. And sometimes there is time constraints, but uh, I'm curious really to anyone here, um, you know, in a minute, what would your thoughts be to kind of promote more of that, uh, to both iterate in realistic time scales, understanding we're probably going to start conservative, but as we get data and we, we can reevaluate those assumptions, and we can kind of move the whole problem closer to a, a, a more complete solution. Yeah, so, really, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I think we have to iterate on iterating. Um, so <laughs> I would say the, uh, the first thing you do is, so for example, in CBRS, let us turn up the dial a little bit and see if we get any interference complaints after you know three months or something like that. Um, and then when I say iterate on iterate, we, we do need to iterate to a manner where in spectrum sharing frameworks, you can adjust those dials much more dynamically, but let's start, let's not try to boil the ocean from the start. Let's make it so we can adjust that dial every month or two or three at first and get uh, experience for how that feedback loop works. Yeah, I, I'll just double down on that. Um, I think Andy's absolutely right. I mean, I think, and we heard this in Fred's comments earlier today, if you don't get to a dynamic spectrum sharing scenario of some sort, you know, we're doomed. I mean, if, if, if you have to sort of understand up front what the propagation environment is going to be like before you can do anything productive, we're always going to be limited by, you know, all of this that's going on right now. The, the, the variability, the uncertainty, the lack of data, um, all of these things are going to contribute. And so, you know, yes, you know, in a perfect world, you know, the, something which Andy describes and something is automated and, it's like, well, I don't really care what the prop model is. I'm just going to start working. And then when I create interference, I'm going to stop or I'm going to pull back. And then whatever the propagation is, it is. But, you know, it's sort of, you know, I, mean, I think we're a long way away from having any sort of a regime where we can do anything like that. And, and Andy's comment of boiling ocean, I think, is a good one. Um, but, you know, we need a lot more data. Um, I think we could still make a lot more progress on propagation models if we have a lot more data, you know, I, talked about that, you know, using GPS satellites and using ADSB signals is just two ideas for generating terabytes of data. The FAA data we got is 36 terabytes of propagation data. Imagine 36 terabytes of propagation data. So I, I think we have room to improve, but Andy's right. If we don't get to dynamic sharing, there's always going to be so much we can do. So. Maybe, maybe one thing I, I add here is I think at least part of this is on the people and engineers who do the measurements and and, um, and do the reporting, 
getting t taking enough care to to present more information uh, on how the measurement has been done, has been done in what kind of environment and and uh, and all the conditions uh, that the type of antennas etc. I, th I think it's 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 very important to make to make the data useful for others also to to have these larger sets and, and again sauna is a very good example in how how this is done but this is and, and Billy you know that we have seen all kinds of all kinds of things right the things come in very very in, in a way that's very hard to verify right and and that and that wastes everybody's time including those who have, have actually done the measurements um and and so in, especially now that we are moving towards um, uh, some uncharted territories, you know, there's 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 um, there's quite a lot of stress on on. Okay, what about above 100 gigahertz, where a lot of uh, uh, the existing models stop working or stop being valid? Um, uh, what about those, right? And so expanding in, into that territory, um, it 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 behooves all of us to to try to do this right again so to, to, to do this right from from the very first step in order to get something meaningful in time it might take longer if you do it right, the right way but at least at least we'll we'll, we'll we'll get there with less trouble thanks Arza. and thanks everyone yeah um yeah this has been a good discussion i i think we could probably talk about this and um go ideas for another couple hours really um because i think we've all you've all seen positive and negatives in the existing process and uh, we need to learn from that we need to take away the things that worked and apply them to bands because as you guys everyone here said spectrum sharing is not going away um and the more rigid we make both the the way the sharing is done and the way the whole process and modeling is done um it just hinders the overall results at the end you know and perhaps in some cases leave no, leaves no one satisfied as to as to where you ended up with no mechanism to go back and kind of improve that. Um, so, you know, we'll end on that. Um, I thank you, Reza, Chris, uh, Andy, Sana, and Tony uh, for being part of this. I appreciate that. Um, and Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you uh, to close that out or whoever's gonna be. Thank you.